So I've been teaching photography on and off for about 20 years, including at the university level. And one of the things that I find that a lot of photographers neglect, particularly when they start out, is renaming their photographs. This seems to be something that all the way up to even serious photographers, it's something that they just don't do. They're quite happy to let the camera continue renaming their files without actually changing the file name at all. Now this can create all sorts of issues further down the line when you're actually trying to use your images in a cataloging system or if you're just trying to find your photographs or back them up or in anything like that. The video is going to be divided into two sections. The first section, which I'm starting with over here, is going to be the principles and the concept behind renaming your files, in particular in a batch way. And then the second part is going to be actually doing it in Capture One Pro. You can use the chapters below to figure out where you are inside the video. So if you don't want to watch the whole thing, just jump through to the relevant sections that would interest you. Also, please don't forget to drop a like and a subscribe into the corner of the video. It goes a long way to promoting the channel. And of course, it's also going to let you know when I have another video available, hopefully. The process that I'm going to be showing how to rename your files in Capture One Pro is applicable to pretty much any cataloging system out there, whether it's Photo Mechanic, Lightroom, DxO, any of the options out there, they all use the same process by which you can batch rename your photographs. For the most part, when you see your images coming off your camera, you're going to see file names along the lines of DSC underscore 123.nef.raw.cr2 or whatever camera extension you happen to be using. The basic naming structure though is a chronological naming structure. It just goes one, two, three, four, five in a sequence basically. The first step is to make sure that your camera is shooting with its file sequence on. Now every camera gives you the ability to change so that every time you put in a new card it would start afresh from one, two, three, four or to continue with a numerical sequence of one, two, three, four, and then when you put in a new card, it will continue with five, six, seven in your naming sequence. As a Nikon shooter, I have to make sure that I go into my pencil menu, your custom setting menu, and go down to D, shooting display, and make sure that file number sequence is switched to on. If I switch it to off, it means that every time I put in a new card, I'm gonna get the same file names. And most cameras are set by default, to ensure that every image has its own unique number, usually starting with DSC underscore and then whatever sequence number you happen to be at. You can also change that if you want to. So for instance, again, as a Nikon user, I have changed mine to EVM, Emil von Maltitz. But that's only the first step because we still end up having repeats of our file numbers. Your camera counter is almost like an odometer on a vehicle. It goes one, two, three, all the way up to 9,999 and then it clocks back over to zero again and you start with triple zero one. So this should already be obvious that you run the potential every 10,000 photographs to have files that have the same file name. And herein lies the problem when you start using cataloging software like Lightroom or Capture One or any of the other uh, programs out there. There's the possibility that when you try to import your photographs into a folder, the catalog is going to turn around and say, this file already exists. We're sitting here in 2024 and our cataloging systems like Lightroom are infinitely better to the point that you can actually import those files and it's not going to come up with the same problem, usually. It still does occur and there are times when I've seen with photographers trying to import their photographs into a catalog that the catalog just refuses to accept those images because it believes they already exist based on the file name. So herein lies the first reason why we rename our files, so that every single photograph that you take is going to have its own unique identifier. That's going to be its file name and it cannot be replicated. You can only have one file name per one image. So that's the first reason, so that our software can better manage the files themselves. However, the second reason is probably even more important. It's so that you can find your photographs without the use of software. Now, there are broadly two schools of thought when it comes around to renaming your files as a batch. And the one is what we call job lot renaming, and the other one is called chronological renaming. Job lot renaming basically means that you are going to put all of your photographs from an event or a shoot or a location into one folder. And you would call it, for instance, Let's say you're shooting for Vogue magazine. You'd have Vogue catalog shoot image one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you happen to be going to somewhere like Namibia, you might have 
um, your image files so that they're renamed Namibia 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, that's what we call job lot renaming. And it basically means that we're giving the job a name or the shoot a name, and then you're having a sequence for your images thereafter. My problem with something like this is that like most of you out there, you shoot a whole bunch of things. And there's also the possibility that your jobs or your shoots or your locations, it's not gonna be the only time that you're gonna go there. So it makes sense to start finding another way to be able to rename your files, which is where chronological file naming comes in. If you look at Lightroom or Capture One Pro or any of the other big catalog applications out there, you'll find that their default is to use a chronological file naming system. Now the chronological file naming, naming system basically takes a date and it sticks it next to a sequence number. If I'm shooting on the 20th of May, 2024, I would have something along the lines of 2024, 05, 20, hyphen, and then a sequence number. The advantage of this, of course, is that every single file that you have is going to have a unique file name, and you can't double back on them in any way because you can't go back in history. The downside is that there's nothing inside there that says what the shoot is. So all you have is a set of numbers, which is a good start, incidentally, because this gives you a sequence number that is going to be unique. How can we look at that file number and know that it is something different that we can just from the text that's inside there in the file name know that this is the photograph that we're looking for. This is where metadata comes into play. Now metadata is the textual information that goes into the photograph. It's usually stored in a little extensible metadata platform or .xmp file next to your photograph or buried inside the catalog software that you're using. Inside that metadata you've got bits of information like location that you shot the photograph, the date, any keywords you want to add, your copyright information, etc, etc, etc. Metadata is important and it's worth getting used to using it. What I do whenever I bring any photographs into my computer, what I do during the import stage is to add the location data to the photograph as I'm importing it. Fairly easy and you can create templates that basically save that information so that you don't have to sit there and type it out every single time you stick a SD card into your card reader. You can use that metadata information to add tokens or tags to your renaming templates. So renaming doesn't have to be difficult. You can literally do a rename for all of your photographs with the click of a button but it's adding the information that is really important over here. What I do is I have my chronological sequential numbering system, which goes year, month, day, sequence, and then I have a location tab inside there so that at the glance of the eye, I can still see where the photograph was taken. So I've recently been in Namibia and a file name that you could quite easily see would be something along the lines of 24, 04 hyphen 17 so in other words it was taken on the 17th of April 2024 hyphen the sequence number so in this case 027 and then hyphen the location which here was Brandberg Mountain in the middle of Namibia. I also have a hyphen EVM at the end and that's just a little signifier that I've been using since way back when to indicate that the photograph was taken by me. The reason for this is very often if I was shooting with a group of other photographers and we were pooling the images at an event, my filing name right at the end indicates who the photographer was. And if I was the DP on that project, I would also ask all the other photographers to hand in their files with the same little integer at the end. It also meant that if we happen to have the same sequence number, you could still separate the two files simply by the identifier at the end of that indicating who the photographer was. That's a unique thing for my shooting style, but again, you might find that useful. Importantly, the naming convention that I use also applies to the filing convention that I have with my photographs. So all of my raw images go into a chronological sequence of folders. So for instance, I would have 2024 as a master folder. Underneath that, I would then have my days potentially or a major shoot, but still with the day attached. So if I look at my individual file name on my photograph, on my one image, it means that I can then use that piece of text to be able to find the folder that the images are in without any software. I can just use the Mac OS or Windows Explorer to navigate my way manually to that folder to be able to find the photographs, which means that 
Applications like Bridge or Lightroom or Capture One, although they are the better option to be able to find the photographs, they're not essential. I've got a redundancy in place. I can go back to the photographs in a manual fashion, and it's also gonna make it a lot easier to find the photograph. You can also continue to add other tags to your photograph. For commercial clients, for instance, I might have both my location as well as the client name inside the file name. You can add as many tags as you want. The basic principle behind it though is that you need to start having a system so that all of your photographs are renamed logically and with, a, with the same order between all of them. My system works for commercial clients, for my natural history photographs, for my video clips as well, although I will adjust that to indicate that it is a film clip as opposed to a individual photograph. We're now in the Capture One interface and I have a bunch of photographs that I actually shot as behind or additional material on a documentary shoot that I was shooting up in Kwanguanas in northern KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. I haven't had a chance to rename them or add any metadata, so this is a really good opportunity to just get into this. Good practice is to add the metadata when you ingest your photographs, which is something that I've done with, this, with these particular photographs as well. So when I select them, you will see that I have a whole bunch of information from the creator content, which is in, under the IPTC contact, through to the actual location of the images themselves. Now, I haven't gone and added a headline to every single photograph because that would actually require going into an individual photograph and giving it a headline. So for me, it's more important that when I'm ingesting my images, I can tell in the IPTC information about the image itself where it is. Out of interest, IPTC stands for the International Press Telecommunications Council, and it's a grouping of a number of international press agencies that basically helps distribute in digital information and information around data. Regardless, this is the industry standard and this is where we place all of the metadata so that you can actually identify where the photograph was taken, its location, the creator and any other pertinent information to that photograph itself. So I make sure that the location, the city, the state, province, all of my natural location data is added. And I very often also add a set of keywords when I'm importing called global keywords. The important thing here is that I have my location into in my IPTC image data. Now, if you haven't added that already, it's fairly simple to do so. My images obviously have information inside them. If it didn't have information, we could come in and you add the location. So let's pretend for a moment this happens to be in London. It's not, but I'm gonna say London. And now I've changed my one image to London. If I wanted to change all of the photographs, because you can see obviously we have Kwanguanas over there, I would select all of my images by saying Command A, all of the images are selected. You make sure that the edit selected icon is orange so that it is actually activated. You would slide up to the top where you can see the little back and forth arrow and you would say apply. All of your images now say that they have been shot in London. Okay, obviously I don't actually want that. So I'm just gonna go back and rename this back to Kwanguanas. So Kwanguanas, which, which is where I was shooting. Right, and then we are going to apply, select all of the images, and we are going to reapply it by clicking on the button and apply. Importantly, I also have all of my copyright metadata inside as well. So you can see up at the top, I've got my creator, the creator address, uh, and various contact means to be able to access me. Again, that's a video for another occasion. Right now we're looking at renaming. The next step is to rename all of our photographs. We're gonna select all of the images and you can either right click on any image and you will see it says batch rename or you can go through to image batch rename images. In either situation, you're going to end up with this dialogue over here, which says the method is text and tokens and you can see currently my renaming is under my usual year, month, day, sequence, location, and then that little EVM that I, I mentioned earlier on. To be able to create your own template for renaming your files, what you'll do is you'll go into the little three dot button next to your file naming, and it gives you your naming format. We're gonna start from scratch. I'm gonna remove all of those tokens. We're gonna save it after we've done this. I want to give my usual sequential or chronological file name, which is going to be year, month, day of the image 
date. So I can go through any of these tokens and I can find that. I want my image here and you can either double click or you can drag it up. So I'm gonna drag it up. And then I want my image month. I'll double click so you can see image year, image month, and there's the example that it's currently building. Then you can put in any textual or typed information you would like, which would apply to all of them. So in this case, I want a hyphen. So I'll add an, a hyphen, and then I want my day. Then I'll have another hyphen after that, and I will have my sequence number. One digit counter, we want to have a three digit counter, and we'll add that in there. After that, I would then have my job name. So I'm just going to go down and I'm going to find job name, job name over here. Then I'm going to go hyphen and I would then say the location of the image. So that's already in my metadata. I'm going to find where that is, location. And then finally, I would usually put EVM at the end by typing EVM. In this instance, the client is very specific in their requirements that they want to have every photographer's full name included in the image sequence. So I will add mine as creator underneath and you will see that the full file name is now going to go 2404, 24, etc, etc. And it'll end with Emil von Maltitz. Currently, it says untitled job. That's not a problem. I'm going to come to that in a second. We then save this as a preset. So you click on your presets over here and we say save current preset and we'll call it, my client in this case is BioWatch. So I'm gonna say BioWatch renaming and I will say save and okay. Right, over here, this is where we put in our job name. So now I can add in BioWatch and you will see that this is going to adjust my file naming sequence here. And then to reset the sequence to zero, zero, there's again the top right little menu button. We'll click on that and we'll say reset name counter. You can also go in there and give it a set name counter. So you can say, I want it to start from image 100 or image 1000 or whatever you would like. You can also change the increments so that they go in 5, 10, 15, 20 for instance. Importantly, you can also pair your RAWs and your JPEGs. So if you've got a RAW and a JPEG next to each other that are the same file name currently, when they rename they will have the same file name again with a differing extension at the end. And that's it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say reset name counter and now when I say rename uh, oh, it's going to warn me obviously about the JPEG pairing. I actually don't need it to warn me again, so I'll just say proceed. Now you'll see all of your file names are going to be renamed in a matter of seconds. So this is the way that you can rename files quickly, efficiently, so that they match your filing structure and they match the way that you use to find your photographs without applications in the background. As I said at the start of this video, it is imperative that you actually rename your files. It's something that seems to be put on the wayside when you start with your photography, but it just makes it more of a mountain to climb when you do finally get around to renaming those photographs. So I urge you to get into your file structure, whichever you, software you happen to be using, and start renaming your files and use a system that makes sense to you. This is a system that works for me. I use sequence which is chronological for all of my photographs so that it's almost like a serial number for the photograph and then after that I'll add job and location so that it's easy at a glance to see where the photographs are taken and who they're taken for. Every photographer has their own naming formula for being able to rename their files. At the end of the day the most important thing is that you do actually rename your files for all of the reasons that I've mentioned in this video. Once again thanks very much for watching I really hope you've found this useful and until I see you again Cheers.